Hello, welcome to our webinar on Lunar Narrative through Apollo Petrographic Thing Sections. I'm Flora Zhu, a sophomore from Greenwich South High School, New York State. I am a student volunteer for the Planet Plus AI program. I will be your moderator for this webinar. Our invited speaker today is Hai Wu Fu, a PhD student at Harvard University. Hai Wu is a cosmochemist and paleomagnetist intrigued by the understanding of terrestrial planetary genetics, differentiation, and evolution. He is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. His research interests encompass tracing the formation and early evolution of the Earth-Moon system using elements in isotopes, understanding stable isotopic fractionation during high temperature magnetic processes, developing radiogenic isotope systematics for applications in geochronology and mental source heterogeneity, and reconstructing ancient plate tectonics using, using magnetization, magnetization recorded in terrestrial rocks. This event is supported by the National Science Foundation and also by the Tennessee Space Grant Consortium at UT. Hai Wu will talk about the lunar narrative through Apollo petrographic thin sections. This talk will trace his recent study on Apollo lunar thin sections. Hi, Ruo. Would you please share your full screen? Oh, yes, sure. Um, thanks so much for having me here. And I'm glad to meet with all of you. And uh, please let me share my screen right now. And uh, yeah, let me change a few things. All right, I'll give it to you. Oh, great. Thanks so much. And um, uh, hi, uh, I'm Hi, Ruo. And uh, um, I'm a PhD candidate right now at Harvard University and I'm graduating soon, but still technically I'm a graduate student. So today I would like to talk about some interesting stories surrounding the Apollo petrographic scene sections, which are made from the Apollo return rocks and some specific properties of them. And fundamentally, um, some useful techniques to identify the different minerals uh, of the rock and also I would like to tie the specific mineralogy and the petrology of the different samples to some interesting uh, lunar ev evolution history stories, something like that. And um, the first thing I would like to know, uh, what are the kind of the composition of our audience today? And are you mostly high school students or college students? Or uh, Yeah, if you can like to tap. But uh, anyway, actually, for preparing for this, um, sharing actually have prepared you know materials that i hope the both high school students and college students or even you know the non-expert of planetary science um, people could understand and take away some useful things out of that and uh, please feel free to say like interrupt me and if you have um any like question that really like prevents you from understanding the next slides or something like that i would like to uh, address and I think believe I believe that we can have a, a panel discussion at the end of it, depending on how quickly, quickly I can finish that. Uh, so I would like to get it started. If there's no question right now, I will try to make sure I can see any ch potential chat. But uh, if not, please um, let me know. Say like interrupting me because uh, I don't think I don't know whether I can see it clearly from just my point of view right now. So what it shows here is just a conceptual. Um, illustration showing what you can get potentially from the surface of the, of the moon, a rock sample, and how do you possibly make it to something else as it show, which is on the uh, upper right, a scene section, and what's that used for, and what's the importance of that to understand the lunar history. Uh, first about myself, um, like uh, Flora just introduced, I'm a geochemist and a paleomagnetist. So as a geochemist, I use geochemistry or chemistry, um, specifically using elements and isotopes to try to understand Earth and planetary formation and compositional evolution. Because basically, these different elements in the universe, they transport, they mix, and they disperse in different spatial scales and uh, through different processes that is involved by uh, the planetary formation. 
So they are useful tracers to actually understand how our Earth formed, how the moons formed, how the Mars formed, and uh, a lot of things beyond. So uh, this is a really um, helpful way to understand the Earth and planet history. And today, the coverage of most of the content is from the geochemical uh, perspective. And second, I'm also a paleomagnetist. I use the magnetic field record in the rocks from the Asian rocks to actually understand the latitude and the longitude even for the place um, uh, back in time in the history. So we can understand how the continents, they move relative to each other uh, at different ages. And also that actually would influence the environment and the atmosphere um, of everything, even including the biology of the Earth uh, at the latter of the time. So today, um, much of the content would be more inclined to geochemistry. The first let's show like um, in the oral view of the Apollo missions, we are the landing site and the sample return. So the Apollo missions span between uh, 1969 to 72, and more than a hundred kilo kilograms samples have been returned from all the successful missions of that. And what we can see like from the 12 to the um, 17, like for the first four missions were more centered around the uh, equator of the moon. So those are the more um, easier uh, locations to land and sample things back. And then um, later for the 15, and the, particularly like 15 and 17, they, um, the missions move to the higher latitude, which are a little bit more challenging for landing, but they actually open some more uh, interesting rocks. Um, I wouldn't say like more interesting rocks, but just from different ages and implications. And you can see like most of the landing sites they are centered around these dark regions, which we actually call the Maya region, which you can take as like oceans. So previously, before people landing on the, on the moon, they thought they would make perhaps like oceans, waters, like there would be a lot, lot of fascinating stories. But then people realize after the landing, they are rocks and they actually formed by uh, volcanisms, just the same type, similar type as what you can see from the earth. So they are like dark lavas um, in composition. And in contrast, these like lighter scale places are what we call um, the moon's highland. They are potentially like, you can say like they are more heavily uh, cratered. That's because their age in general is very old. And those represent perhaps the oldest rock on the moon. And they, uh, in the case like they were not recovered or covered later by the other mare basalts, then like they retain their uh, features and the, the light colors. So once successful missions of the 16 actually sampled a lot of the highland samples from this white region and the other um, regions sampled more composite uh, uh, compositions from both the mare basalt, which we call mythic uh, in ge geological terms and the felsic rocks as well. And uh, also like please note that all of the successful mission were uh, performed on the near side of the moon. And we can talk about what, what about the far side later in the in the talk. And so what do we do on the moon? We sample on the moon if like we have astronauts landing here. So you either, either pick, we either hum down or we either like drill the course out of the moon and bring back with the spacecraft. Those are some pictures um, uh, where the astronauts sampled on the surface. And once we get a large chunk of the sample, what uh, NASA did was to separate them, like slice them into different sections. So they can distribute them and the people from different places can study the different aspects of that. And one particular way to treat this sample is actually to slice them down to very, very thin, thin sections, which is only around 30 micrometer. So you can imagine like the rock will be very transparent so the light can pass through. And after people uh, slice it down to this very thin section, what we call, and then they mount it on the glass with epoxy to fix them so they can be used uh, in other purpose. So this is one of the thin section of one particular sample that I'm going to introduce a little bit more uh, later, so which is uh, identified as 6225. So the six, so the, the numbering has its like a traditions as well. So we have um, like six successful missions, like from 12 to 17. 
And if the first number of the sample is six, it means it is from Apollo 16. And then the rest of the four digits actually um, designate the sampling order and the, the naming of that. And if you see there's a comma followed by another numbers as a two digit or three digits, it means that it is a sub sample of the large sample. So people use this to, tr to keep track of the dispersed and distributed samples. And if we have a sync section, so the most useful ways to observe them directly. So under a petrographic microscope, it has not, it can't be other just euro type of them, but it has to be uh, particularly made with this purpose. So let's we call this petrographic microscope. And uh, the most important feature, uh, so uh, this is the uh, rotation place where you can play sample and you actually observe things from these binocular eyepieces. And what makes the petrographic microscope very different is that it actually is a polarizing microscope that has two different polari polarizing filter. One is beneath here and the other one is right up here. And what uh, the polarizing filter does is to actually polarize light to so we can imagine like when light propagates, it actually vibrates at all the different planes. But if you have a polarizing filter that only allows one direction of vibration to pass through, then the light intensity will be decre decrease decreasing. And also you will only reduce all the planes to just one direction that you like it to happen. So what we see here is a scenario that the light will encounter when it reaches this um, lower polarizing filter. And also this type of microscope has another upper polarizer, so which only allows another vertical direction to pass through. So imagine that, so we have a light that encompasses all the potential uh, vibration planes. And then going through the lower polarizer, you have reduced all the direction to one. But this direction say that is like east west word direction. If it encounters, another polarizing filter that only allows the north south word direction, what will happen is that there will be no light going through the upper polarizer, which also means that you should see nothing. There's no light. All the light has, could have been eliminated by this. So why people just make a microscope light make you see nothing? This is because this is more than this. Because of the minerals property, we actually can see light instead of nothing. So say like if like you place no sample on this plate, what you would expect is just darkness. But if you actually place a mineral green right here above the lower polarizer, the actual green will, the mineral green will kind of serve as another uh, polarizer uh, in its function. It will actually refract the one single direction of vibration of the light to two directions. This is so-called double refraction. And this only happens for anisotropic minerals only. So for the anisotropic minerals, uh, it's a kind of mineral light. If the light actually shines through the different along different directions, is um, the light speed would change, would be like different, uh, it, depending on which direction you actually um, making the light to pass through. And uh, in the opposite, opposite sense, there's another tab we call it isotropic minerals, which means no matter which direction the light pass through, it always travel at the same time uh, and at the same speed. So then for the isotropic minerals, they do not refract light. But so only the uh, aniso uh, anisotropic minerals can do that. And then they actually separate, separate the original one direction to two directions. And then you can imagine that, so when these two wavelengths reach the upper polarizer, there will be certain fraction of them can pass through this north south word filtering. And you actually can see lights and uh, figures from the binocular eyepieces. So if you only apply just one single uh, lower polarizer, what it will call is the plane polarization, which uh, also correspond to its name. Because if you only apply one polarizer, the light will only vibrate on a single plane. So that's what, what you call PPL. 
But if you actually apply the two uh, filters together, we call cross um, polarized light, which we call it XPL. So this is when you actually have the mineral in between and they will like do the double refraction for you and you see some different scenarios. And we actually see like those are the two same field of views, but we see the color of them look very different and why. So this is something like we will cover shortly. So let's first I talk, talk about the plane polarized light and what are the specific features you want to pay attention to when you observe uh, minerals uh, under light condition. The first thing is about like the different types of minerals. They have basically different habits. Like some of them tend to become like an equant, like olivine is one particular type of mineral. And some of them would like to grow like rectangular and some of them may form very like elongated shape of them. So if they really have good space to grow themselves, they just want to be like this, unless they are confined actually by some other conditions that if they only have certain space to grow, they wouldn't grow as well as they wish. So they, they need to be constrained by the spatial consideration as well. But to the first order, the, the crystal shape is kind of a very important perspective and a very kind of give you kind of an obvious or um, straightforward impression of what you are looking at. And the second thing, it will be the artificial or the apparent color that you see from the PPL light. So you can imagine light when you have white light, say if you have a bulb, uh, this bulb can just give you uh, the white light that encompasses all the different wavelengths corresponding to different color. But mineral greens itself actually would preferentially absorb some of them. So what you see actually from the eyepieces would be only what has been left um, by the filtering of the mineral itself. And also the second thing is that we talk about that the mineral can do double refraction and also it's kind of um, orientation dependent, which means that if you rotate the mineral along certain directions, maybe like it will change the its optical axis direction. So the ob absorption of the light will be different, which depends on which rotation you actually have. So that's why if you actually rotate the stage, say for 90 degrees, the apparent color for one particular mineral that is uh, shown in the middle, which is uh, uh, also pyroxene, would might change from the light yellow to transparent to non-color. And all of these uh, minerals have, you know, like certain and fixed predictable range of changing. So you can use this to actually, actually characterize different minerals. And not only we see this uh, inherent property as we, we call it, pleochroism, and also some other minerals does the same thing. For example, the beltite, which is, is like a little bit darker brownish, after you rotate the plate, they can turn either lighter or even darker. So if you see this part of the pleochroism, so it is also distinguishable for you to identify some of the mineral species. And also, um, please like rem uh, keep in mind that those colors are not natural colors. So when we talk about colors, we always want to make sure that, that we know like what kind of color we're talking about. There can be like reflective colors or when we deal with the transmitted colors, we need to understand the absorption. So I would say that those are just apparent colors, but nevertheless, they are very useful techniques uh, to for this purpose. Uh, the other thing is that some minerals actually have these like cleavages, which are actually, we see the minerals, but they have very pickable and the consistent directions like showing uh, this kind of configuration. And those uh, planes are actually the planes of weakness, which which means like mineral along those directions can be like fractured or like moved more easily than the others. So like you can see for this diopside sample, you actually see two directions um, of these um, repetitive planes. One is along this direction. The other one is kind of vertical to that, almost like 90 degrees apart from each other. And for the CPS, actually it stands for canopyrexine, which is another type of, uh, they also have this like traceable and uh, visible signatures. And this sample actually you can still find, but it seems like those directions, the one and two, they actually have an angle of around 60 instead of 90. 
So this sample is kind of a humbland, an amphibole group of the minerals that has this characteristic 120 degrees of the intersection. And at the end, if you look at this belt head sample, it has a perfect and uh, just one single direction. So this is also characteristic of that. So basically it means that some of the minerals, I mean, we are lucky, like they have very predictable and fixed angles of the intersecting of these cleavages. So we can use them under the PPL to look at them and actually to tell apart between the different uh, types of them. So after talking about the PPL, we can talk about XPL. It is when we see the field of view when we apply both the lower and upper polarizer. And one of the interesting is that, so for the double refraction of a green minerals, it not only changed the vibration direction of one um, particular plane to up uh, to two random um, vertical directions, but it also changes the light speed. So here we can see that there are two refracted light, but one is faster than the other. And then actually, if when the two lights eventually reach at the eyesight, they actually has a difference uh, of arrivals. And actually that creates a retardation of the two wavelengths. And because we know like if the two lights, they are on the same plane, but they are in phase, which means like they, um, the peak and the valley of the vibration are consistent, we shouldn't observe any interference. But actually, if the two lights are out of phase, we start to, to see interference colors. And we also know that only the anisotropic mineral can do that, so not the isotropic itself. Um, Oh, I actually wanted to use this side to talk about extinction, but we will talk about interference color. But for the extinction, um, in another word, it actually applies. So say, because we know that the upper polarizer only can let the north south direction of the light to pass through. So you can imagine that, so we see these two are now kind of vertical to each other. But if you rotate the stage, there will be four chances out of the 360 degrees that one of the plane actually overlap or they just occur to be at the same plane as the eastward, east-west world direction. That means there will be no light to pass through the upper polarizer. So what you should see is a complete darkness. And that should happen every four times when you rotate a plate. Uh, plate. That means like 90 degrees apart. So that's what we call extinction or the extinction of light. And it's for isotropic minerals because there's no double refraction and all the lights travel, travel just the same and the mineral wouldn't refract the light into two different planes. So that means there should be always darkness uh, when you, no matter how you rotate the stage. And uh, another case would be for the opaque minerals. They just don't let um, light to pass through at all. So for those cases, like we shouldn't see anything, not only in the XPL, but also in the plane polarized because just light just doesn't go through. So for example, uh, let me show like an interactive image here, which is very interesting. So this website that I coded here is really helpful. So I see um, the plane polarized light shows some darkness, minerals, and well, they remain dark and there's XPL. So what does it mean is that these minerals should be opaque because I couldn't even see them under the plane polarized light. So there should be some particular minerals like, uh, say, iron uh, titanium oxide. And for the other minerals, like they are transparent in the middle. That's cool. But after we look at the XPL, if I rotate the stage, let's just uh, observe any of the minerals. Say this piece. So now it's at 353. After I rotated, I found it gets extinction at around 331. Let's just rotate for another around. 90 degrees, 244 or 241. More precisely, it thinks it thinks that means this mineral must be a uh, isotropic isotropic mineral that can do the double refraction, and it actually should apply to all of the different minerals that you look at here. And also, you see the color apparent color actually changes very much, and this is what I'm going to talk about: the interference color. 
Okay, next page. Um, th this one last slide about extinction. So when we observe extinction, we actually combine this extinction with the um, cleavage as well. So if the extinction, so the angle when you observe, observe the extinction, if the tip of the field of wheel actually corresponds to the cleavage direction because it's parallel, if they have an angle because it's um, inclined extinction, if like the uh, inter, uh, if the, the middle part of the two um, planes of the cleavage is actually correspond to the uh, orthogonal place because it's symmetrical extinction. So different minerals have different types of them. Say also pyroxene always have parallel extinction. Cloud pyroxene have inclined and hoplandy, which we see like from that has 120 and 60 degrees of um, cleavage actually does the symmetrical extinction. So this is a very useful technique to tell different mineral speech uh, apart. And next we talk about the interference color. So that is when you have a faster ray and a slow ray, and these two wavelengths actually interfere uh, um, together. And uh, so here is a chart that shows a different type of mineral, what is the typical interference color you should see. Say for the olivine, it almost as one of the very abundant and common minerals, it all, always has the highest third order, as we call it, the greenish, yellowish, or pinkish color. So in the field of view, these very vibrant color, they all belong to olivine. And uh, say, um, at the opposite sense, for the quartz, which is like uh, the sense, like the, if you go to the sea, the um, quartz is the most abundant um, mineral in the sand, and uh, like feldspars as well. And uh, say, kind of pixing, they have relatively lower um, degree of the interface color. So they are like lighter. So using this kind of difference, you can actually also tell the different minerals. And uh, just um, peace of mind that when you rotate the place, because you're actually actively changing the optical axis direction. So you wouldn't have a fixed interference color. Instead, you will have like a range of variation. But this range of, of variation is also predictable. So that's why when you think about the olivine, uh, particular mineral, we are not looking at one place, but also a, a large range of that. If we go back to this, even for the olivine, it can turn from purple to some of the lighter colors. So that depends on what is the particular um, optical axis you are looking at. So next we can talk about the twinning. Twinning is like, um, the crystal is not alone. It has a twin which grows together or later with it. So that's where we can see that for the multiple different minerals, they actually grow along different directions, but they tend to stick together. So for the different types of minerals, they have different purposes. For the albite, which is one type, uh, the sodium end member of the plagioclase, it actually has the polysynthetic twinning which is a uh, characteristic uh, features of that. For the calcite, um, which we call def deformation included twinning, is that for the calcite, it has these two directions, uh, actually three, but in the 2D plane, you can only see two, the two directions of cleavages. So the twinning might start to form along these cleavages, which is predictable. And also we may have some more like a simple twinning for some of the type of minerals. The cyanidine is one of the potassium feldspar. It's the potassium end member of the plagioclase composition. So it doesn't grow the same um, polysynthetic twinning as mm -hmm. the other counterpart uh, of the plagioclase does. And also hornblende um, can do the same thing. So this is also some uh, very helpful techniques to tell uh, the different minerals. So after talking about that, so what is the general importance of studying the thin sections for the, our studies? First, I'll say like we like to identify specific mineral species. We want to know more about them, about rock. And also not only the composition of them, but also the, uh, the textures and how they grow together. Whether you think this texture belongs to a uh, igneous rock, which like cool from the magma, or it actually represents like sedimentary um, formation and whether these uh, minerals are euhedral, which means like they grow very well along according to their willingness to grow, or they have to be forced to grow to either like a roundy or a shape that they, they don't like. Actually that indicates the formation 
conditions of these rocks as well. The third is that we actually have a really clear field, field of view. We can calculate the relative minimum abundances. So that's actually a really big deal because we want to know like actually when the magma cools, I'd say like at different temperatures and the compositions, the relative proportions of the different minerals predicted for that particular concentr concentration uh, would change. So actually you can use the relative proportion of the mineral to tell about what type of magma you're actually looking at, what is the precursor of them. And also we like to observe the mineral like at mic microscopes. And also this will tell us about more, say like whether the mineral has zoning, whether they have you know some interactions uh, say like between the rim, between the contact with the other minerals can tell about what's the cooling history and what is the more complicated, like they say, secondary alterations between the minerals. And lastly, we can actually perform some microscale analysis for the element and, and the isotopes. Say like some of these spots were, you know, analyzed by uh, some techniques, say we call like electron probe or laser ablation to just understand the specific chemical composition or isotopic composition at a specific spot. And we can not only see the mineral's composition, but also the mineral across the different part of one single mineral. So we see whether there is any diffusion, whether there is hydrogenity or any other interesting part you can see. So in general, it has a lot of interesting applications. So late, uh, starting from now, I would like to introduce four very interesting lunar rocks that has been intensively studied. And some of the research outcomes come from the study of the scene section, some may not, but uh, let's try to see what are the, these four uh, lunar samples can piece, uh, what type of lunar history um, storytelling. So first things that in general, like just want to introduce how the moons formed, I mean, uh, from a kind of a popular way that uh, scientists think. So we think like solar system formed at around 4.567 billion years old. So which is kind of very easy to remember. And the moon actually formed very closely followed by the formation of solar system. And likely because of uh, the collision between our Mars says the impactor and hitting on the earth and create a nearly fully molten moon and creating a large magma pool, all liquid, and then they start to cool, to lose heat to space. And then many of the different minerals start to form. And because of density difference, they start to accumulate at the bottom of, of it. And until most of the liquid has cooled, the moon's formation ended. And because of um, the different minerals have different melting point, when you actually cool a magma, different composition will come out out of the magma at different stages. So we have some so-called mantle cumulus. Those are the denser minerals that first come out and also they have a higher uh, melting point and they accumulate at the relatively bottom place of the moon. And also you can imagine like after you uh, cool a magma, there will be some residual part of the liquid. If say, if like you also have the what do we call it, a thermal boundary layer that is above, above that, you may imagine that this residual magma, although it's only just a tiny small amount, it may cool very slowly. So you just cannot get rid of it. So it will probably stay here for a while. That's what we call the residual magma ocean. And those parts actually record the last bit and uh, you know, are also fractionated or we say differentiated, a uh, evolved composition. So you can imagine like, Initially, the magma's composition is homogeneous. It's just a homogeneous. But after you actually separate minerals out, that residual magma composition will start to become more different and different and different until you have a very different composition somewhere here. How do we know that? Later, I will use one sample to demonstrate. And also you may, I mean, actually on the moon, it's very unique. You have a thermal boundary layer, like, you know, block the heat loss eventually. Those, uh, this crust is actually made of uh, anosite, which we call anosite crust. Anosite is a type of sample that is mostly made of by uh, anosite. And because, so this is also a primary product, product of the cooling of the magma. So we see many denser minerals will go down, it will sink down because they are heavier than the magma. But these anosite minerals, they are lighter. So they will flow up to the top and they seal the whole magma from it losing heat more quickly. 
So, so we have basically simplified these three layers and we actually have some lunar return sample from our polymations from each of the layer, which is lucky. The first thing we talk about, the another side, we just talk about that, which is the very light mineral, com uh, mineral composition and also it will flow all the way to the top. And more importantly, this type of sample actually is presumed to form at the initial cooling of the moon, which means they are probably one of the oldest samples. And luckily, the Apollo 16 project returned a sample like this. So uh, above is um, the photo like two uh, was taken by the, uh, the NASA people. And here uh, at the bottom is a picture I took from the same sample, but in the Smithsonian Museum uh, in Washington, DC. I just took it um, last spring, which, which I found really exciting because I have worked with this sample in the lab. And now I see a larger big chunk of that, which is really exciting. And just remind everyone that the sample may have come from the another side crust. All the samples were picked up on the surface, but you know some rocks may have been formed you know, deeper, but because of the magma wheel up well, and also there are some highly you know, um, cratering events that may actually exhumed some of the deeper rocks all the way to the surface. So the astronaut can pick the rocks which belonged to the deeper part of that. And for the petrology, so we call this sample accumulate, which means that it is the accumulation of the crystallized mineral from magma. If they say they have like uniform, but different density from the magma, they either sink or they either float and they would just come together and aggregate to become this type of the, um, the sample. And this sample is mostly made of plagiarism, crystal, very uniform composition. So like as uniform as what I show here, just a single color, but it has a small amount of clinopyrexin and also pyrexin, which are the, the two types very closely related, um, relatively mythic minerals. And they could have come from some deeper mantles such as the mantle cumulate, but the, nearly above 90% is just pure plagiarism. And let's look at how it looks under the microscope. So again, this is a very useful source uh, from the lab website. So if we see the plane polarized that, if we rotate, that doesn't change much, but uh, actually the, um, in the um, very middle of here, it is, should be uh, also pyrexin green. It should have a very a small uh, pleochism, but we, we don't see it here. And we can see there's no dark mineral, so which means all the mineral here, at least they are transparent. And if we look at the um, cross-polarized light, we can see this uh, pyrexin actually go extinct four times. So which means it is, it is an isotropic mineral. And also we actually see at least one group of cleavage. And if we do the extinction analysis, we see, well, there's certainly an angle of this cleavage relative to the cross um, directions, which means it has an inclined extinction. That reminds us of that this could be a clinopyrexin instead of osopyrexin, because the osopyrexin should show um, parallel extinction. And for the other, all the rest of them are the plagioclase because plagioclase tend to have a very light interference color, uh, this like gray and whitish. And the, the pyroxene actually has higher. Color pyroxene could typically be this like yellowish, brownish, and also pyroxene could be, you know, more vibrant, like green or blue. So it's quite a, you know, like um, distinctive feature when these two types of mineral are together, the interference color is so different. And we actually can see some of the twinning here. This is dark, this is uh, lighter. We have both pedoclase. When you rotate stage, they is tinged at different angles. This is because although they are the same composition, but they grow along different directions. So the way that they do double re re refraction uh, is different, so they actually go extinct at very different angles. And what, another thing that we can see is that much of these grains have been highly um, bracketed, which means they have been, you know, like say crushed and you know, squeezed, you know, you know, even like um, 
like there's a lot of frictions between these things and the, the green size isn't the best uniform. That is because this type of sample, they sat on the surface of the moon for too long and just they happen to be actually cratered by another impactor. But it's still lucky uh, when we brought, when we bring this back. And uh, also after the analysis, we see that although heavily, you know, cratered or fractured, we still retain mostly the very pristine composition from the Earth's uh, the moon surface, which is impressive. So let's go to the next one. Uh, what is the significance of this sample pass? Because I mentioned that possibly these uh, kind of highland rocks representative bed, and also said this light colored surface could be the uh, oldest samples. So like how old is it actually represents how old the moon's formation is. So previously from um, last century, people thought these plagioclase samples like all of this uh, gray and whitish um, mineral composition could be from around 4.5 billion years ago. That is almost as old as solar system, that's exciting. But then like 10 years ago, some people found the some other dating techniques which actually use the radiogenic law. So say like uranium decays to a uh, light. And then, so in the lab, people uh, like geochemists find to measure how much light is preserved and uh, which is the ratio of the light relative to uranium actually the the um the higher the light concentration is in general like the older sample should be something like that and if you are interested in that we can discuss more so like but when these uh, um scholars some other scholars uh, actually analyze pyroxene they found well oh, well it actually gives a different age uh, that shows 4.3 fell. That is much younger than the, the solar system formation. So it's really hard to reconcile. And for your information, the pyroxene again is what we see from here. Not the this specific um piece of green, but the same type of mineral. So this kind of dilemma. So which one we should actually trust. But actually it doesn't matter because the different mineral could have different ages if this sample is, itself is uh, complicated. So some new studies are uh, including one, uh, like I uh, was the author, um, I found like after recalculation, this petal case actually still gave a fairly consistent old age that is close to the uh, solar system formation. And also some interesting studies that just came last year using another type of mineral, which is called zircon, that also is a nice recorder of the age also show a very, very old age of that. So I think we reaffirm that the moon actually formed node based on this particular sample, 6025, and also some other piece, pieces of information. And second, I would like to talk about a chocolate light sample, which chocolate light is also a cumulative sample. That is, the, its mineralogy is simple. It's just olivine and plagioclase. So the greenish minerals are olivine. They are very mythic ones. They're, melting temperature is very high. They are basically the first group of minerals that can come out from a cooling magma. And the other lighter ones are what we just talked about, plagioclase. And they actually formed at this interface between the anosocyte crust and the deeper mantle cumulus. And this petrology is also cumulate. It's also kind of like minerals settling out of the magma and become a sample. And uh, it has very simple um, mineralogy. And if you look at this, it's actually just a field of, of two minerals like nearly in contact from each other. So what about this mineral? It's like greenish, it's whitish, and there's XPL. And also it seems to have directions of the cleavage. And it is pedocase that we just uh, saw. And the other one that has very vibrant color, it must be olivine. And it is. It's also like highly fractured. So like fracturing is a very distinctive, distinctive feature for the audience as well. So they happen just in the same field of view. It's really nice to show. And uh, if we rotate the stage, it also goes extinct four times. And you can see also there's a, a analysis spot. So I believe like people use, uh, say like laser ablation to just like use the heat of the laser to make this rock to be powder. And then they are ionized by a uh, say like argon plasma, they become like different ion species and to be analyzed by a mass spectrometer to analyze what is the uh, different isotopic or elemental concentration of the specific part. So that's another you know demonstration of how important the scene section could be for this very fine scale in situ uh, analysis. 
So what about this um, sample? What does it offer for us? Actually, this is very interesting implications from this um, particular sample. So people have, say, from the XPL, they found some interesting algorithm. They do analysis, which they actually analyze the phosphorus content across one single algorithm. You guys, like what they found? They found actually there's a quite a variation across some boundary. And what does it mean? It does mean that the composition of a single mineral is not homogeneous. There is some diffusion of the elements from one spot to another. And the, after calculating the sharp transition of this difference, people think it actually cools very fast, around 600 degrees per million years, cools much faster than previous results, like higher by a factor of two. And what does it mean? It means that this magma must have been in contact with some wall rock that has low temperature. So they couldn't have been, say, formed from here because that will take much longer time for them to cool. It has to be, say, penetrated in some of the upper part of the crust. So because if you have like a cooler body, which is close to you, you actually cool faster. That's why they came with the idea that these samples actually formed by a later process after everything have become solid, but then some of the solid release some melt composition, become like liquid, and li this liquid interact with the solid part. And that means the magma, like this solidification must have been disturbed later. There's some like a movement between the different parts of it. And then people interpret that it because this is a density driven. So this is a very interesting thing to constrain such a process can happen at around 4.35, which is just after the most of the materials of the moon has already solidified. So it gives some really interesting implications. The next one, uh, we can take a look at the creep sample, which is some sample rich in plasm rare earth elements and the phosphorus. Actually, it comes from the residual magma ocean composition is around 5% of uh, leftover. In this spectrology is basalt, which is a volcanic melt and melt um, solidified to become this type um, of uh, sample. And it has plagioclase, different types of pyroxene, and eumenet with a very interesting uh, composition that is mostly seen from the lunar basalt, but not from the terrestrial basalts. So if you look at this, so in the um, middle of the view, we have like an interesting elongated pyroxene that has been analyzed by different spots of it. And also it can like um, wave together with the other plagioclase compositions along the field of view. And you can see like the pyroxene has a relatively higher order of the interference color. And also it's, it doesn't seem to me like there's a clear um, cleavage though. So sometimes uh, some features are prominent, but uh, in some other cases it is not. But you can certainly see the twinning of the plagioclase like along this direction and this direction. At, at, at least like one direction is a solid or here. So you'll see like the same composition but they have different extinction angles, which also demonstrate like loads are likely calcium rich hydroclase. And if we go to the next slide, the significance of it is actually very prominent. So here it actually shows a compar comparison between the creep composition, the, the sample that is reached in this element uh, compared with the modern results. So the modern results actually model the compositional change of the residual magma ocean as more and more liquid has become solid. So to match this sample with the modeling result, it requires that the whole moon must have already solidified by 99% of that. And we know this creep layer could be abundant in, uh, in the moon because we see many returned by cells record this signature. That means the moon itself must have been largely molten, melted, to produce such a large layer of residual magma ocean that has a so enriched composition like this. So this is the kind of the part of the very important evidence that calls for um, like fully molten or largely molten moon back in the Apollo era. It's like one sample that is capable of seeing. So actually there are like more creeps samples like this. So lastly, we will look at uh, a humanet basalt, which is humanet rich, so to give its name. And it is actually possibly the remelting of this part of the mantle cumulate to make it and to erupt at the surface to be collected. And the 
pathology is similar to the creep sample, but it has a lot of humanite. The humanite itself is an opaque mineral, so the field of wheel should remain dark. Uh, uh, this part you are looking under the XPL or the PPL. So you can see like this is totally dark and the same wheel is the same. So it's certainly um, iron, some oxide, but the particular composition of that need to be analyzed chemically to actually verify what is that. And uh, for the other mineral composition, we see some potential also piercing and uh, with very vibrant uh, interference color. And also this like plagiarism case that we should be like more and more familiar uh, as we like look more and more. And for this type of mineral, one of the interesting is, is that human net composition is so high. It's around like 20% or 30%. You can, you can read it from the view. And it's very rare to be seen from the Earth. So Earth, uh, the relative um, concentration of the titanium oxide is only a few percent. But on the moon, for the human net basalt, it can reach 20% or 30%. This is really, really different from what we see from the terrestrial sample. And how could that have uh, be reconciled? So one of the sensible way to interpret that is this human net basalt could be the product of the remelted mantle only in the late stage. So we use some isotopic pairs as a tool to actually, so this curve is a molding result to see what is the expected range of this particular isotope of magnesium and iron to be for the late stage cumulate, which we have human net uh, in it. And actually the real observation, which is confined by these uh, squares actually fit well. So we have kind of consistent story that mm, maybe this um, this human and basalt, it should come from the remelting of the late stage um, of the mantle. And this is another study that show, oh, it also works well for the calcium, uh, comparison of calcium versus magnesium, because all these measured samples, which are shown as a dot, are we seeing the model range of this. So it's very compelling story. Although like some other new, research says uh, something slightly different. They think like maybe this type of the isotopic signature could be um, have been made by actually diffusion between the melt and uh, the adjacent cumulus. But in either way, uh, this melt how to come out of the melting of the late um, lunar magma ocean mantle cumulate that involves human night itself. So we see that the result that we see from the basalt actually comes from the early accumulation and uh, the late accumulation, and this this accumulation actually remounts. So, which also indicate that Luna is magmatic dynamic; it has a lot of changes. Um, and so much of the storytelling for the four samples, if we like inter integrate these stories together, so we have sort of system formation, and luckily we have some samples that is indicative of the moon formed very old. And later we have some other samples, seven, six, five, three, five, the chocolate that to indicate, oh, there were some overturn of the mantle. The mantle was uh, not stable at all. And then later we have some creep basalts that shows, oh, there is quite a bit of the residual magma motion that we can sample from the rocks. And also the human net basalt, where we can see that clearly like the very late stage cumulate, they become from solid to the melt again, and uh, luckily we sample that. So this is basically the story of, of those things. And I know like uh, from our uh, seminar, there are potentially some uh, machine learning experts. I would just like to extend a little bit on, you know, like how to, is this a possible that like, people can do automatic identification for the minerals according to the knowledge, which could be a little bit difficult, but not impossible. But so uh, I'm not an expert um, in machine learning, but I just, like to throw out some thoughts. So it's better to use dynamic images as what I, we just showed. If you can rotate the stage, you can see much more features. You can use that to do the identification. They, they are more, way better than the static images is a um, typo. And if dynamic image is not available, at least we can use say like a, a rotation views of different parts for the same minerals to facilitate this purpose. And also, we should have the views from both PPL and XPL because there's, there's a lot of interesting thing you can look together, so not just one. And also, I know some of the photoing would you know distort the original color, like like you can see from your eyes. So a good 
say like a, a camera that records the, the really precise interference color could be important because we use interference color precisely as a scale to actually gauge the different range of light. And what else we can talk a bit more if more sounds uh, come up. So uh, I would just like to say a bit of the outlook of the new um, lunar samples return. So those are the current all like uh, lunar landing projects. And you can see most of them are from the near side of the landing. And one um, outlier is the China's Chang'e project um, that actually goes back to the far side, which is the first time. And it will be more interesting to sample more from the far side because there's kind of a symmetry of the topography and the compositional difference. And the Chinese are actually planning for that. So the May 2024 this year, um, so the Chinese are planning to send the Chang'e 6 all the way to the South Pole area of the moon. The importance is that not only it is from possibly from the far side of the moon, but also this South Pole is possibly the oldest terrain on the moon. So we may better, you know, have some samples returned by the robots. Uh, people, I mean, we, I mean, people, they can actually analyze it to see whether the moon's formation age can be even like extended. And uh, actually the Artemis uh, from the US uh, for the sample return and the human landing mission from 2026 is also targeting on this very old terrain. So just like it would be a lot of exciting new sample return to look forward to. And uh, that's it for my presentation. And thanks, thanks so much for um, your attention. And uh, I'd like to take questions and uh, discussions. Hi, Ruo. Thank you for your amazing presentation. We enjoyed it a lot. Um, and we have some questions in the chat. So let's move on to the Q&A part. So yeah, sure. I have a question. There are some conspiracy theories about the Apollo missions. Some people doubt the moon landing really happened. What do you think? Uh, I think you can actually view this question from different angles. And as a scientist, as a geochemist, I see it from geochemical evidence. <laughs> Just a lot of evidence like I show here. First thing is that you are never going to make a basalt this rich in titanium on the earth. I already mentioned that it's really hard. It's really hard. And it, it has to come from, you know, a very differentiated and isolated layers. And another thing is that we have never measured something on the Earth that lays with this enrichment pattern for the rare earth and other elements. This is certainly uh, something that has been extremely fractionated, like in the moon's composition. And another thing is that we don't have a sample that can yield, yield this old age for 4.5 because for the Earth, its early mantle has been all mixed and there's no record of the oldest you know, part of that. So from this like simple lens of evidence, I'm convinced that the samples that like, people have dealt with come from the moon. And also there are certainly more from that. All right, thank you. The moon has a near side and also a dark side. So is there any lunar, lunar mission that has visited the dark side? I think I just uh, uh, kind of referred to that in one of this slide. So luck luckily, yes, uh, Chinese did. The but it's um it's just a landing. It's not a sample collection, and uh, it's really good if people say for the Chang'e mission and Artemis they can collect the real sample from the say both the South Pole and the far side of that. And although it's be the reason is like landing on the far side has been more challenging, but people are challenging themselves to make it work. So kind of look forward to this. It um maybe. Much of the moon's history would be overturned if like more samples turn to yield very interesting, unexpected results. All right, thank you. So personally, I have a question, but I feel like you kind of like answered that. Mm -hmm. but I need to expand a little bit. Um, so I was working with the petrographic images of lunar rocks, and mm -hmm. I was really intrigued by the change of colors under you know plain polarized mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. So the cross polarized light. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to me it's very human labor intensive to figure out which type of mineral corresponding to the grains. And sometimes that, you know, the grains can be very big and sometimes the grains are so tiny. So do you think somehow we may have an automatic mineral identification system? Yeah, so it's among what I kind of talk about here. So uh, I think the successful implement implantation of implementation of that needs like discussion and actual collaboration. So not only just like this verbal description, but I would think like, I think dynamic images or, you know, like 
uh, different image, images from different angle rotations would be great to start with. And uh, it just like, so you can, it would be like extremely hard if you just randomly get one image from the Google search and then give it to the machine learning and let it tell what it is. It better these, you know, these, there's, uh, you know, um, strategic, uh, um, you know, like a sequence of, you know, well-planned images for one of the sample. And if that can be standardized, I think um, in time and, uh, you know, people should be able to make it. And also like, it's better if like people can cross test it, you know, like a machine gives the an answer and, uh, you know, some expert look at it to test the accuracy of the outcome. Okay, so we can use like machine learning, right? To identify <laughs> several different like minerals. I think ideally. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it should work, but uh, maybe not now. If not now, but it should work in the future. Okay. Um, I feel so honored to have you in this webinar. Would you like to say something about Harvard? For example, like what is the most wonderful thing about Harvard from your perspective? Uh, I think the most valuable resource is people. I mean, I, I really like uh, people here at Harvard. Like uh, we kind of share the same passion and uh, like they are enterprising, they're friendly. And uh, even, I, I'm glad to be a researcher and a student uh, at Harvard for that purpose. It's just like kind of invigorating and uh, conducive. Uh, yeah. I Rola, thank you again for your phenomenal presentation and answering our questions. Thank you all for joining us today. And I hope to see you again on our next webinar. Bye. Yeah, thank you.